In this unit, I'm going to briefly introduce partial fraction expansions. Rational functions appear in many mathematical contexts. In some such contexts, working with rational functions of relatively high order can be undesirable. For this reason, it's beneficial to be able to express a rational function as a sum of lower order rational functions. This could be accomplished using a type of decomposition known as a partial fraction expansion. Partial fraction expansions have many applications. For example, in the context of signals and systems, this type of expansion is often useful in the calculation of inverse Laplace transforms, inverse Z transforms, and inverse continuous time and discrete time Fourier transforms. Consider a rational function f as given by this particular formula here, where v is a complex variable, the alpha k and beta k are complex constants, and m and n are non-negative integers. The quantities m and n correspond to the degrees of the numerator and denominator polynomials respectively. As a matter of terminology, the function f is said to be strictly proper if m is less than n. In other words, the degree of the numerator polynomial is strictly less than the degree of the denominator polynomial. By using polynomial long division, any rational function can be written as the sum of a polynomial and a strictly proper rational function. Furthermore, any strictly proper rational function can be expressed as a sum of lower order rational functions, with such an expression being called a partial fraction expansion. Any arbitrary rational function can always be normalized such that the coefficient of the highest degree term in the denominator polynomial is 1. In other words, a rational function f can always be written in this particular form here. Where v is a complex variable, the a, k, and b, k are complex constants, and m and n are non-negative integers. Note in particular that the coefficient of the highest degree term in the denominator polynomial is 1. In other words, this term here has a coefficient of 1. Furthermore, through factorization, the denominator polynomial d of f can always be expressed in this particular form here, where the pk are distinct complex constants and the qk are positive integers. The pk denote the poles of f, and the qk denote their respective orders. If f only has simple poles, then q1, q2, and so on up to qn are all equal to 1. Suppose now that f is strictly proper, that is, m is less than n. Then f has a partial fraction expansion. The general form of this expansion depends on the order of the poles of f. In particular, there are two cases to consider. The first case is that f has only simple poles, and the second case is that f has at least one repeated pole. First, let's consider partial fraction expansions for the simple pole case. So suppose that the rational function f has only simple poles. Then the denominator polynomial d of f is of this particular form here, where the pk are distinct. In this case, f has a partial fraction expansion of this particular form here, where the a k, in other words a1, a2, and so on up to a n, are given by this particular formula here. Note that the pole p k contributes a single term to the partial fraction expansion. In other words, the pole at p1 contributes a single term, which is this first term. The pole at p2 contributes a single term, which is the second term, and so on up to the pole pn. At this point, I'd like to consider an example of computing a partial fraction expansion for the simple pole case. In particular, I'd like to consider example b.1. In this example, we're asked to find the partial fraction expansion of the function f, where f is given by this particular formula here. To begin, we can make the observation that f is strictly proper, so it does in fact have a partial fraction expansion. 
To find the partial fraction expansion, we first need to fully factorize the denominator polynomial for f. In other words, factor it into all linear factors. So z squared plus 3z plus 2 factors to z plus 1, z plus 2, simply by inspection. So the function f has two simple poles, one at minus 1 associated with this z plus 1 factor, and one at minus 2 associated with this z plus 2 factor. Now we need to identify the form of the partial fraction expansion that we're seeking. Since f has two simple poles, the partial fraction expansion will have two terms, one for each pole. So the pole at minus 1 will contribute this first term, where a1 is a coefficient to be determined, and the pole at minus 2 will contribute the second term, with this coefficient a2 to be determined. To compute a1 and a2, we use the formula for partial fraction expansion coefficients in the simple pole case. So if we compute the coefficient a1, the formula that we use is we take our function that we're trying to find the partial fraction expansion of, which is f, and we multiply this by the factor that's associated with the pole whose coefficient we're computing. In other words, this factor is z plus 1 here. And then we choose z to force this factor to go to 0. So z is equal to minus 1. If we evaluate this, then we get 3 for our answer. Then we do a similar thing for the coefficient a2. So we're going to take the function that we're find, trying to find the partial fraction expansion of, which is f. We multiply it by the factor associated with the pole that goes with the coefficient a2. So this is this factor z plus 2. And we force this this factor to go to 0 by evaluating this expression at z equal to minus 2. And when we do this, we get an answer of minus 3. Now if we take the coefficient values we've computed for a1 and a2 and substitute them into this equation here, we obtain this last line, which is our partial fraction expansion for f. Now let's consider partial fraction expansions for the repeated pole case. So suppose that the rational function f has at least one repeated pole. In this case, f has a partial fraction expansion of this particular form here, where the coefficients a, k, l are computed using this formula here. Note that the q, kth order pole p, k contributes q, k terms to the partial fraction expansion. For example, the pole p1 which is a pole of order q1, contributes q1 terms. So all of the terms in this first set of square brackets are all terms that are coming from the pole at p1, which is a pole of order q1. So in to total, we have q1 terms. This is the first term, second term, and so on, up to the q1th term. And the pattern that we have for these terms that are in square brackets here, this first set of terms that are all for the same pole, all of the terms have a constant in the numerator, like what we have here, and in the denominator, we simply have increasing powers of the factor that's associated with the pole. So here we have a f the factor raised to the power 1. Here we have the factor raised to the power 2. And so on up to the last term where we have the factor raised to the power q1. A similar pattern is followed for the remaining poles. The pole p2 contributes these terms here. In other words, the terms in the second set of square brackets down to the capital Pth pole, which contributes these terms here in the last set of square brackets. Lastly, I should mention that because this formula here involves factorials, we have a factorial operation here, the definition of n factorial is, is given by this formula here. And also, 0 factorial is simply defined to be equal to 1. At this point, I'd like to consider an example of computing a partial fraction expansion for the repeated pole case. In particular, I'd like to consider example b.2. In this example, we're asked to find the partial fraction expansion of the function f, where f is given by this particular formula here. Now, you'll notice that the formula that we're given for f has the denominator polynomial fully factored into linear factors. So we can very easily identify the poles of this function and their corresponding orders. Due to the factor z plus 1, that, which is squared, we have a pole at minus 1, which is of order 2. And due to the z plus 3 factor, we have a pole at minus 3, 
which has order 1. Now we need to identify the form of the partial fraction expansion that we're seeking. The pole at minus 1 is a second order pole, so it will contribute two terms to the partial fraction expansion. In particular, it will contribute the two terms inside this dotted purple box here. The pole at minus 3 is a first order pole, so it will contribute a single term to the partial fraction expansion, which is this term here in the dotted green box. Now what remains to be done is we need to compute the three coefficients in the numerator of these terms, so a11, a12, and a21. And to do this, we simply use the formulas for computing partial fraction expansion coefficients. In the case of the coefficients a11 and a12, because these coefficients are associated with the repeated pole, we have to use the formula for partial fraction expansion coefficients that applies to the case of repeated poles. So computing a11 in this way, we substitute into the formula for handling repeated poles, which gives us this, this uh, line here. And to try to make it easier to see where I'm substituting different values, I've color-coded this so that the places where I'm substituting the coefficient number, so like we're computing the first coefficient for this repeated pole, um, I've highlighted this with a reddish kind of color. And in the places where I'm substituting the order of the pole, I've indicated this by green. So for example, here is where we're substituting into the formula the order of the pole. It's a second order pole. So all of this is just substituting into the formula. And then we grind through the calculus because we need to compute a derivative here of a rational function and then simplify. And in the end, what we end up with is one for this coefficient. Then we proceed on to the coefficient a12. This one is also associated with a repeated pole. So we have to use the more complicated formula that deals with the repeated pole case, which is this formula here. And then we just grind through the algebra and simplify, and what we get is a value of 2 for this coefficient. Then lastly, the coefficient a21. This coefficient is associated with the simple pole. So in this case, we can use the formula for computing the partial fraction expansion coefficients in the case of a simple pole, which is this formula here. And then if we grind through the algebra of simplifying, we get a value of minus 1. And then we can take the values of a11, a12, and a21 that we've calculated and substitute them into this partial fraction expansion here. And this gives us this line down at the bottom here. And this is our partial fraction expansion of the function f.